Okay, okay. thank you very much, Professor thank Morgan. You. I'd like to welcome our next speaker is Dr. Felix Herf, who's probably one of the world's experts on endobronchial valves. He's from the Heidelberg unit in Germany, um, and he's also a health economist. So welcome, Dr. Herf. Yeah, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, my first time that I really s stay and speak in uh, Edinburgh. Last time I stayed in Edinburgh and have to give talks in Glasgow. It was during the ERS a uh, couple of years before. Uh, my conflict of interest, I work with everybody who is uh, working in that field. Um, I'm a pulmonologist, so I also work with the inhaler companies. And if some companies are in the room, they want to see their sign on the <laughs> slide, just contact me after the presentation. Yeah. Um, but to focus on that presentation, I work with every company who is offering techniques uh, for emphysema treatment. I did the most of the procedure as the first in human procedure. And I, I also work with a couple of companies and the techniques you, will, you never heard about, and, but you will hear about. And I did a couple of lung worm reduction surgeries together with my surgeon, so I know how to handle and stabler. I think we can skip that slide, uh, saving some time. So we have enough patients around the world, and we're knowing exactly what happens to a patient when a patient develops an emphysema type. We're knowing COPD as at least is the term we are using, but we have different types of COPD patients. And uh, what that means for the patients when the patient is developing in hyperinflation, you see here, this is at least the COPD group. Uh, and when you match them for that endpoints, you see that the measurement which really is changing the survival curve for the patient is the amount of hyperinflation. So when a patient developing hyperinflation, the survival expectancy is really down compared to somebody who is more suffering on a chronic bronchitis type of the COPD. So deflation is uh, really the point we have to work on. And uh, the idea behind uh, volume reduction story is really it's a mechanical idea. We want to remove the hyperinflated part. We can improve the breathing mechanics, improving the exercise capacity and the quality of life, which is for me a very important endpoint in that subset of patients. And at the, at the end of the day, maybe we can change the mortality when we are reducing the hyperinflation. And the first group who started with that, uh, Years away, 1956, Otto Predigan did the first publication on that, uh, and he re really made it to the Richard Digest, a really high-ranked journal. He published that, and then Joel Cooper brought it in again, but uh, Dirk will focus on that. The question then was, it seems it works, the lung worm reduction story by the surgeons, maybe in a specific subgroup of patients. Can we do it easier? Can we do it? cheaper and maybe safer when you look to the mortality data which have been published from the net trial. Uh, the valves, you can for sure see them down at the booth area or maybe you used it already. It's a one valve, one way valve. Uh, you deliver it through an, during a normal bronchoscopy. And for those of you who have never seen it, here is the movie. You see it's an old movie uh, produced in 2004. It's still the same. Um, technology, it's the same procedure. You go in, bring the valve down to the target area you want to treat, and then you deploy the valve into the bronchial system, and you can see directly how the valves are working. You see how that duck mouse opens and closes, depending if the patient is inhaling or exhaling. So quick procedure. So even a pulmonologist can do that. Yeah? Um, the publication story, it starts like always, a couple of first reports. The first report came from UK, it was from London, from the Royal Brompton Group. They published the first experience, a couple of patients, eight patients, and then over the time it started with case series, bigger case series, and even larger case series. The question is what happens on the randomized control trial level? They have been two trials, similar design, the US VENT and the Eurovent group. Um, and you have seen that data published. Published in high-ranked journals, New England, and even the European Respiratory Journal. But to be honest, when you look to the overall results, control and treatment group, there was not a big difference. 
FE1, 5%, what is 5%? That's nothing when you have an FE1, 0.7 from the beginning, six minute walk test, 4%, 5%. And even the St. George is not really reaching the level of minimal clinical improvement. So what happens to the company who provide the valves? The FDA rejected that data and that company get bankrupt and uh, then the next company bought it. And uh, what they did, they did an analysis of all the data. Because this is one of our patients we have had in that trial and you see this is before and after. Um, this patient really benefited a lot. FE1 went up for 51%, RV went down for 40%, six minute walk test up for 60 meters, so that patient was happy. So most of the centers who participated in that trial have had patients who really showed a huge benefit, but they also have had patients who haven't only run in complications and not showing any benefits. So the question was, what are the predictors of success? The first, what we learned, we have to work carefully. So we want to have an, a lower exclusion procedure, so placing valves in all holes which leading to a lobe. And the, only when you use the valves in that mode, the patient can develop an atelectasis, what we are needing to have, reduction of hyperinflation. And you see in that patient, here's a valve quite placed correctly, here's a valve quite placed correctly, but there is an open bronchus. This patient will never develop an atelectasis, never will develop an effect. And what you have seen, 44% of the cases in the Euro or in the US VEN trial have received the valve placement, which was not correct. So the first is we have to know what we are doing, and that clearly shows you you need centers of excellence who are doing the procedures. The second was um, we looked for the fissures as a marker if there is flow between the lobe. When the patient has had an incomplete fissure like on that size, there can be a so-called color ventilation, so you can block one entrance, but the air is coming from the back door and is refilling that lobe. And we look to patients who have had a complete fissure as a signal, there is no ventilation between the lobes and maybe we are able to really achieve an atelectasis. Um, the first of all is uh, the company react on that and they build up a new device because sometimes for anatomical reasons we are not able to use the valves we have had before. So nowadays we have a shorter valve uh, which fits in easier so we should overcome by newer valve types that problem that we are not able to close the segments in the proper way. And the second is that we are looking nowadays before we deciding the patient might be a candidate for the valves if the fissure is complete. And when you reanalyze the data I showed you before, and when you only go for the group which have had a complete fissure by the CT and they have had a procedure where you really close the whole lobe, now the, so the story makes sense. You see, this is the group. FE1 went up 28 in the US, 20, uh, 22 in the US, 28 in Europe, and even the St. George minus 5 and minus 10. Now the story makes sense. And based on that analysis, we are knowing nowadays which type of patient really benefits from the valves, more or less the group which have had no color ventilation between the lobes. Talking to surgeons, my surgeon is always laughing when I talk about complete fissure, an incomplete fissure, and you see he gave me that image. This is how it looks during an operation. There are always anatomical yeah, fissures visible in when you open the chest. But the question is, is that also functional color ventilation or is this only something you see during the surgical procedure? And the other point is fissure reading is not, is not so easy. This is a subset of patients we did in Heidelberg and a pulmonologist analyzed the fissure. The other pulmonologi pulmonologist analyzed the fissure independently and you see the correlation. You can throw a coin, there was no correlation. Then we asked an expert chest proteologist and a second expert chest proteologist. And even you see on the right side, okay, they, they did fine, but left side it went down. And then we did the same, the 
pulmonologist one and pulmonologist two, and this is a general radiolog radiologist, not a radiologist who is doing only chest X-rays uh, or chest CT scans, and again, throwing the coins. So it's hard to find somebody who is able to do that Fisher analysis. Uh, and this is the ER, ER one, this is my chest pathologist, Professor Heusel, only doing chest imaging, nothing else, the whole day. And we have about 1,000 candidates per year who are asking for volume reduction. So it's a huge workload. He's, and he's an expert, but you would maybe have a problem to find such an expert. What you can do, you can do the chartist measurement, you also heard about, and you will for sure will see that at the booth. This is a balloon technique where you place a balloon catheter at the area you want to place the valves, and then you analyze the signal. When, you, when the outflow signal is decreasing, you know there is no flow from the unblocked lobe. When you have a persistent outflow signal, you know the flow is coming from the lower or from the upper lobe, where you haven't placed the catheter. So nowadays, when you do not have access to such an Radiologist, you can you do the measurement before you maybe place the valve. The data have been published clearly showing that it makes sense to do that analysis. What will happen in the future? In the future, you will have an automatically um, fish analysis. These are software programs we are working on. And yeah, you see this is the fissure, and this is the incomplete part of the fissures. And then you can analyze that. You, you, you get the data, you get numbers, and then maybe you can get rid of that chartist measurement. Because the patient is always a little bit nervous. They have to go through a bronchoscopy where you do the measurement, and only maybe half of the patient really ending with valve. The other patient is only ending up with a measurement and not the procedure, so maybe from a patient perspective, having that information in advance if the patient really shows a benefit or not might be helpful. And comparing to the surgeons, we can also use it in the lower lobes. You see, these are the data from the US and the Eurovent data. These are the upper lobe data. These are the lower lobe data, and you see no difference. So it also works in the lower lobes if you have a candidate for that. So it, it's a technique which you can use on both sides, and which is also shown in a couple of patients. We really need volume reduction. When we are not able to see an atelectasis or a partial atelectasis in the x ray, the patient will not show any benefit. You see, this is the group which have shown a volume reduction for more than 50%, and every endpoint went in the right direct, um, in, the, in, the, in the correct direction. When you see every one six minute walk test and uh, exercise capacity, when you do not have really a volume reduction, it, nothing happens. So we need the atelectasis to have at the end benefits for the patients. Side effects, most side effects is the pneumothorax in all the trials. Sometimes it's, it's like that, a little one, so you don't have to uh, be uh, nervous or starting any action, but it also can happen like that. Uh, the patient received valves in the upper lobe, and uh, you see the patient afterwards. Um, the good story is that when the patient developed pneumothorax, this happens normally within one or two days after the valve placement, all the patients show the huge improvement. Because what happens, the patient developed the so-called rapid atelectasis syndrome. When you do it in the upper lobe, the lower lo lobe have to um, expand in the upper area where the lobe have been before, and then normally and adhesion in the untreated lobe rupturing, and there you see if the patient developed a pneumothorax, this is the volume reduction up to more than three liters. When the patient do not develop the pneumothorax, the effect is not as big. So nowadays for us, a pneumothorax, which is the major complication of the valve placement, is also a predictor of success. You should know what you should do when you have such a problem. This is an expert um, consensus. You will see that EPUB available next week, uh, and I marked it in blue. This is a, the reason why you have to do that in a multidisciplinary setting. There you sometimes need the surgeons to repair that problem. And the mortality uh, from the first two cohorts, the Royal Brompton group and the Italian group, we have had long time survival data until now, not randomized blah, 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 all the limitations by the trial designs. But it seems that when a patient developed an atelectasis or having here a complete fissure, 
and getting Atelect is as well. There might be a survival difference for our patients um, over the period. At the moment, the US and the Euro when data are analyzed for that, and maybe we can um, again repeat that data. And just to give you the whole overview, what, have, what we can offer for the patients where we have an incomplete fissure situation. Here you see the fissure, here it's disrupted. Um, therefore, we have the coils. Uh, coils are normally a uh, bilateral procedure, 10 coils each. Each coil is about 10, uh, it's about 1,000 euro. I have no idea about the prices here in the UK, so it's a little bit more expensive than the valves. And the evidence is, is at the beginning. This is the only randomized control data we have for the coils, came from the Royal Brompton uh, small patient group, and, and only 90 days follow up. I think 90 days are a little bit early, but it seems in that group, especially here, the six minute walk test, it seems to be working. But we have to wait for the longer uh, follow up, and we have to wait for the, for the international multi center trial, which then really will give us the explanation which patient might be benefiting from that. Just for you and the pulmonologist, we're calling that the lung volume reduction technology, but when you look to the changing in the residual volume, it was not statistically significant. So I believe that the coils, the mechanism of action is not a reduction of the hyperinflation. This is a different mechanism of action, but a couple of groups working on to explain what might be really be, uh, happening when the patient having an effect. And the last technique, it's the glue. Uh, you already mentioned, uh, uh, it's the vapor. You mentioned the glue. The glue is gone. The company has closed, uh, so you will hear nothing about technology. Uh, but we have the steam where we can inject hot water to have at least an artificial inflammation which leads to a scar formation and maybe in hyperinflation. Even therefore, we have data. Having some ideas which patients might be benefiting from then, there you, you need a specific scoring on the initial CT scan, then it might be working. But uh, you have to have in mind you are creating an artificial inflammatory response. This is one of our patients three weeks later. It's hard to distinguish. Is this an SAE or is this the treatment reaction you want to see? At the end, the patient has had benefits, but we also have had a, a couple of patients who went through a hard time after such an inflammatory process. So we have to see where the clue story ends. But summarizing endoscopic lung worm reduction with valves and uh, even giving my comments to the surgical technology. You see, this is the, US, the net trial and what happens to the FE1, the MCID is here, to the six minute walk test, MCID is here, and to the St. George, MCID is here. The same value you can have with the valves, but when you compare it with inhalers, which we are calling the standard of therapy, you see, especially in the St. George, in the quality of life question, which is a very important question for my patients. Um, the inhalers are not able to do the same what we are able to do with our endoscopically or with the surgical technologies. And uh, to summarize that, there was a, an expert meeting in Zurich last year, and this is the expert consensus at the moment not published. Something we should talk about, we should think about, and Dirk will for sure focus on that. Think about if transplantation is an issue for your patient. A couple of the patients are younger, and you might be offering them uh, a lung transplantation. But on the other hand, you should see the patient, you should see the patient on, the, on a multidisciplinary board. You have to measure what you can measure. You need the CT functions and you need the perfusion. Um, information and then you will have different flows if the patient has a heterogeneous disease. Therefore, LVRS or the valves are options for patients having no color ventilations. For patients having color ventilation, it's only the surgeons where we have at the moment. The rest should be done in clinical trials. In homogeneous, we do not have good data for any of the technologies. Therefore, the recommendation of the expert panel was only in clinical trials and as mentioned before, just think about if lung transplantation might be an option of, for your patient. Therefore, I want to summarize my talk, I think, with the 
Valves, we have promising and effective options for our patients suffering on an emphysema. The morbidity is acceptable, and especially when the patient develops pneumothorax, then the patient has for sure effects at the end. The valves are a subgroup therapy. It's not working in every emphysema patients, and I believe personally that an that we will never have a good trial comparing surgery to endo technologies because these are different patients. Um, I believe that patient selection for the different technologies is crucial, and therefore I believe you have to look for a good radiologist because in the initial CT scans and the analysis we're doing on that initial CT scans, we might be have the information which technology fits for that patient, and therefore thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Hurt. Any questions for Professor Hurt? Hi, Neil Chowdhury from Leeds. Um, thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, my question is about fissures, and he quite rightly pointed out that fissures, you know, the MDT or anything is the most contentious uh, part. Um, looking at the CT scan, are you recommending that even if the fissure is incomplete on the CT scan, you'd still want a chartist evaluation? That's my first question. Um, Actually, I'll let you answer that, and then I'll ask my second one. Yeah, um, it, it's a very good question. At the moment, we have that data analyzed, and it's uh, we have it submitted to a public to to uh, to a journal. Even in the Chartist trial, you have seen that there have been patients which are Chartist positive, so at least having a color ventilation flow by the technology, but having effects. And therefore, I believe what we're doing at the moment is a little bit black and white. So we're saying chart is positive or negative, then you get it, you, you don't get it, and it's only one signal we are analyzing. It's the same for the fissure. When you, the, when you read the original papers, the fissure integrity must be 90% or more. That information came from Jonathan Goldin, which was the radiologist for the US and the Eurovent trial. I met Jonathan quite often, and I asked him one evening, hey, what is the rationale of that 90% integrity? You know his answer? He decided it was my decision. So we have no evidence that 90% integrity is enough. So at the moment, we, there are a lot of trials ongoing looking what is exactly what we have to looking for. And for the reason that complete fissure is not always complete and Chartis is not only positive or negative, I think we have to work more on that. When we have really a gap where we, at the moment, do what we're doing in daily routine, when we have a gap for more than 50% by the fissures, the patient is out for any blocking techniques. Yeah? When we have a fissure which might be 70-80% uh, in uh, complete, we're doing the Chartist measurement, and then the patient is in a trial to answer that question. Yeah. I think, thank you. Uh, I think you partly answered the this is my second question by saying how much. But do you sort of, uh, when you sit down with your radiologist, are you looking at all kinds of cross sections when you look at the fissure? So it's not just a cross sectional. Yeah, yeah we, have the, we, have, we have the advantage that we are working with a couple of software companies. So everybody has on his workstation a program that we can modify <laughs> the view to the CT scans in every direction. But you have to do that three dimensional. And what we're also doing more and more. And I believe this is, might be the f one of the futures. We are using MRI perfusion and CT information and matching them. There you have in a three-dimensional way the information, where is the perfusion and where are the, the emphysema parts of the lung. Because the classical perfusion measurements, you show that. It's only you, you're looking there on up front, but it's not an anatomical information. Therefore, we we matching MRI perfusion and the CT scan might be, be having more information on that, but this is also at the moment under investigation. And I promise this is going to be the last question, but <laughs> can I? I? I just want to take the opportunity. Um, do you think that there might be latent sort of collateral ventilation, like, you know, you, you see something like 70 to 80 percent complete fissures, or it may be a complete fissure, and you do charters, and it's, there's no collateral ventilation, but a few months down the line, you find that the, maybe there was an initial effect, there was collapse, and it's disappeared. Have you noticed that at all? I yeah. mean, 
Yeah, it, this, this happens. To, <laughs> this happens quite often, and also I can give you the answer what we're doing in such a patient. So, because it's an easy answer. When we are able to placing where of patient developed an atelectasis, is placing effect, uh, receiving all kind of effects we want to see. Patient is happy. We are happy, and the patient is coming again, and he lost the effects. First of all, we. Do, checking the valve placement, um, if the valves are still in where they should be, and uh, if the valves are looking normal, we don't see any valve misfunction, we send the patient to the surgeons, and they're doing a lobectomy. And all patients did great after that surgical procedure, because they're doing what we are not able to, to do. We have a permanent atelectasis. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, a couple of brief questions, Barbara <laughs> and I, the thoracic surgeon. Is there a role for pulmonary rehabilitation yeah. prior to uh, endobronchial valves? I think the pulmonary re rehabilitation is quite important for all CBD patients that they have a program where they're doing that continuously. We analyzed the data from the US and the Eurovent. We didn't lost one patient due to that rehab program, which was part of the trial. So I don't think that we need rehab programs as an inclusion or exclusion criteria for offering the patient something. We have to work on that the patient is continuing doing some exercise. And therefore, I believe it makes more sense to send the patient to a rehabilitation program after the procedure that he really can train based on the new air he has and not before. The uh, second question is, is there any role for bilateral uh, and a bronchial valve placement. Yeah, at the moment, we have a couple of patients who received the valves 10 years before, and then it's an ongoing disease. Uh, patients have had effects, developed an atelectasis, came back five, six years later, and then when the patient has a target on the other side, we also did that on the other side. But so a worldwide, stage procedure. Worldwide, is maybe 10 or 12 patients, so really limited experience, but it works. And then the final question, which is probably the most contentious, if a patient comes to you who's suitable for either procedure, either to have surgery or to have endobronchial valves, how do you make, who makes the decision as to whether they get one or the other? The patient. So we, we recommending the patient, you are a candidate for both, and then the patient have a, a visit by the surgeon, a visit by, by the IP group, and then the patient is deciding. But to be honest, I don't believe that we have a lot of patients which fitting for everything. I think at the end of the day, maybe in five years, we will have a clear definition based on the CT scans, and I don't know what else to say. This is surgery, this is valve, this is coils, and whatever is coming. Simon. Uh, Simon Jordan, thank you very much for your talk. I, I work with um, Palav Shah and Nick Hopkinson at <laughs> Brompton, and when uh, I get to operate on the patients, they turn down. But certainly having an MDT has, has made a big difference to our practice, being able to offer coils and steam and, uh, and valves. Which, uh, who do you think should implant the valves? Do you think it should be the thoracic surgeons or the respiratory physicians, or do you think it doesn't matter as long as it goes through an MDT? And do you think there's a minimum volume caseload that uh, an operator should be um, uh, trying to achieve uh, to, to gain enough experience? Yeah, it's a good, good question, but I think this question is normally answered based on the local situation. Uh, you know, when you're working in a center, you have somebody who is responsible for the IP workload. And if this guy is a surgeon, then the surgeon should do it. And if this is a pulmonologist, the pulmonologist should do it. The important issue is that the patient is seen in the multidisciplinary board. And I think due to the referral acceptance, often the pulmonologist is the person where the patient is referred to. Yeah? So if that pulmonologist then is placing the valve or not, I don't think that that really makes, a, makes sense. I completely agree that there must be a minimum of patients you should treat per year. But you have to see that for, the, for all the technologies, so you have to have enough surgical uh, patients, you have to, should have enough IP patients. Uh, at the moment, we, we discussed that in Zurich a long time, if we should come up with a recommendation, what is the minimum number of patients? We do not have data for that. Uh, when, you see, when you compare it for lung transplantation, it's 25 tr lung grants per year that you are really able to handle the problems. Coming, bringing it back to my part, to the endoscopic part, the procedure is easy. This is even, we have stand placements which, which are way more complex than a valve placement. Yeah? 
What makes it complicated is the handling of the complications, and therefore you need a specific number that you see enough complication to get, uh, to, to be really able to handle that situation. Thank you, Professor Hurt. 